All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Ocular Pathology Rounds on October 18th, 2023. I will go ahead and get started, maybe. Okay. Our first case is um, we got uh, both eyes from a five-year-old neutered male Labrador, Labrador retriever mix. I almost said laboratory. Um, Labrador retriever mix. Um, we got kind of a very brief history here considering what we're looking at, but uh, it's sufficient. Um, so they say exophthalmus, ulcerated and bleeding globes, both eyes. Um, they say both eyes similarly affected. Um, they say one year history of swelling slash scabbing of both eyes. Um, so I got the globes and um, grossed these in. And uh, so right off the bat, so the cornea is at the top, believe it or not, um, as we always orient our gross photos. Uh, the cornea is actually hardly recognizable. Um, the surface was opaque and the globes were very misshapen. And I trimmed some of the extraocular tissues off, I think, including the lids. Um, but uh, a lot of these tissues uh, were not trim offable in part because this is the sclera um, and this is the cornea. So it was difficult to actually trim those off because they're one and the same. Um, but so you can see this is both eyes. We got right and left. Um, the sclera is extremely widened. It is off white to yellow orange. Um, and that is true over here. And that discoloration and expansion does extend into the corneal stroma in both eyes. In the right eye, you can actually still recognize some <laughs> normal, quote unquote, <laughs> deep corneal stroma. So there is still some identifiable corneal stroma there. Um, there is asteroid hyalosis in the right eye, but otherwise the eye looks pretty normal. So you can see a nice normal looking optic nerve head. Um, you can imagine that they would not have been able to measure the intraocular pressure of these eyes because of the grossly, like severely abnormal corneas. Um, the left eye, however, is a little bit more misshapen. And then also there are these like white plaques that are probably under the retina, like um, on the surface of the choroid. Um, and I can't remember exactly what's going on up here in the anterior chamber. That might just be um, looking at the abnormal cornea, like uh, the deep end of it. Um, anyway, so I am just gonna show you the more severely affected eye, which is this left eye. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Here, here. All right. So here's our subgross view. Um, in this particular section, we actually did a sample of a lens of this uh, left eye, uh, but it was there somewhere. And that was not the most important part of this case. So here I have the cornea pointing to the left. In this case, here is an iris leaflet. Here's the other iris leaflet. You can see the retina is detached. There's a little bit of hemorrhage in the vitreal space. Um, and the optic nerve is sampled here and it is abnormal. So um, from this view, you can just see how greatly expanded the sclera is and also the cornea is just completely effaced. And also you can appreciate there is once again, some normal deep corneal stroma that's still present and identifiable. So to get your bearings, here's the iris leaflet. So we're looking at deep corneal stroma here. Decimase membrane is discontinuous and very curled up there. Uh, and there's a uh, dense collagenous tissue on both sides of it. So there's definitely some deep corneal stromal fibrosis and anterior chamber fibrosis. Okay. This? So these curves are going to go to have a few should be oh. right here. Instead of standard, the white screen. Okay, go. All right. Uh, Sorry about that. Okay. Better view. Here we go. Uh, anyway, so just that was just helping you get your bearings. Um, so iris leaflet, there's a nice membrane on the front of it, a little bit of entropian uvae as the pupillary margin curls inward. Um, but uh mostly what's going on is what we're gonna focus on out here. So um, this is the grossly, severely hyperplastic um, corneal epithelium. 
it is uh, definitely hyper or keratinized um, and um, it's actually uh, ulcerated right in this region. So there's a corneal ulcer. Um, some people call this epidermalization of the corneal surface because this resembles the epidermis much more than it which should it resembles the corneal epithelium. But anyway, so the corneal stroma itself is expanded by this population, a dense population of cells. It's also vascularized. There's a nice blood vessel. And you can see that there, this population of cells is a little bit heterogeneous. So it's a little bit more pale here. And then we've got some foci where it's darker purple. And that generally means that there is a mixed cell population. Now at this magnification, we can't really tell if this is neoplastic or um, reactive or uh, inflammatory. So we're just gonna go higher mag here. Uh, once again, as we get higher mag, um, the heterogeneity uh, is still apparent. And it's sort of a gamish of cells. So we have probably just about everyone came out to play here. Um, but there are numerous plump cells like this guy that have uh, moderate amounts of eosinophilic cytoplasm and kind of oblong nuclei with maybe some finely clumped chromatin and a single variably prominent nucle nucleolus. So these guys are probably all histiocytes or macrophages, and there's a bunch of them here. The other possibility for some of these spindle-shaped cells is going to be a fibroblast of some sort uh, producing some extra collagen um, because this whole, um, the sclera and the cornea are so greatly expanded by not just the inflammatory cells, but also probably fibroblast producing collagen. So there's a certain degree of fibrosis here. Um, and then there are also, let's see here, some of the smaller cells like these guys right here are probably lymphocytes. And uh, let's see here. We also have some eosinophils. So here's one here of uh, the bilobe nucleus and bright bright pink uh, cytoplasm. Here are a few more over here. Um, and there are probably some uh, plasma cells around, although at the moment I can't identify one on the screen. Um, and what we're missing as far as um, trying to rule neoplasia out, although I've already told you that my interpretation at least is uh, an inflammatory cell population. We don't have great cellular or nuclear atypia in any of these cells. We're also lacking uh, mitotic activity. Um, and the mixed cell population is, is good for a um, reactive cell population. So if we travel around a little bit, um, one thing I was struck by this case is that there's actually really nice perivascular whirling or whirling, um, which is a little bit um, unusual for this condition as far as I can tell. So. This population of mostly histiocytes with the gamish of other inflammatory cells that's in the sclera and the cornea are, is basically granulomatous, um, scleritis, and keratitis. Um, so this is um, synonymous, sort of clinically speaking, with what we call, um, uh, some people call necrotizing scleritis. Um, this case happens to also involve the cornea, which is a little bit unusual. Oftentimes it will stop right at the limbus, and sometimes it will be specifically only affecting the cornea. Um, and so um, what we're seeing here is the histiocytes whirling around the blood vessel. Um, so that brings up another histologic diagnosis possibility. Before I get to that, um, here are some regions where we have these sort of bundles and clumps of collagen that otherwise lacks cells. So collagen itself cannot undergo necrosis because it is not a living substance. It is an extracellular matrix. Um, however, it does um, house fibroblasts um, that sort of uh, are the living components of the sclera. Um, but what we have here are these regions of really sort of collagen degeneration, and there are very few living cells left in them. There's a few nuclei here and there. So some people would just sort of offhandedly call this scleral necrosis, um, which, you know, can be true depending on, and ultimately you're getting the point across that the, the scleral collagen really is, seems to be the target here of the inflammation. Um, so this is a, um, an idiopathic inflammatory condition. Um, in this particular case, that perivascular whirling is sort of unique, and I don't really recall seeing it before in cases of granulomatous slash necrotizing scleritis. However, that is one of the pathognomonic features 
of what is called reactive histiocytosis or systemic histiocytosis, depending on what body parts are affected and how widespread it is. And that is considered to be on what it's on the spectrum of otherwise somewhat mysterious histiocytic diseases of mostly dogs. Uh, cats are much less often affected. Um, so I thought this case had some interesting features of both what we would typically call granulomatous or necrotizing scleritis, and then the perivascular whorling uh, brought up the possibility of something like reactive histiocytosis. I should add that both of those diseases are on the spectrum of idiopathic, i.e. sterile, granulomatous diseases of unknown etiology. Um, just to move back a little bit and show you how extensive it was in this case, you can see how the sclera is just pretty much effaced by this inflammation. Here we're picking up some relatively more normal sclera. And also the inflammation extends right into the uveal tract, uh, which is why we were seeing those off-white plaques in the gross photo. So you can see it here. And then when we get back to the optic nerve, you can see how severely affected the optic nerve is. Um, these are the more histiocytic populations, and these are definitely going to be more of the dense lymphocyte, uh, lymphocytic foci. Um, the retina is not surprisingly detached, uh, probably because the RPE is um, not very healthy anymore um, based, uh, because of the inflammation. So the other eye was surprisingly um, symmetrical to this. It was slightly less affected. Um, so... I'm trying to think of what else I forgot to say that was just somewhat of a discombobulated uh, tour of this eye. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So um, this was the uh, diagnosis that I gave for both eyes. So chronic severe granulomatous and lymphoplasmocytic scleritis and keratitis with multifocal scleral degeneration slash necrosis and multifocal perivascular whirling um, and DDX just the clinical term granulomatous, quote unquote, necrotizing scleritis versus scleral and corneal reactive histiocytosis. Um, I don't think it matters what we call this. It's basically um, idiopathic histiocytic inflammation of unknown etiology. Um, we got very little information about the rest of this patient, but um, I guess we could, actually, I take that back. They said general medical conditions, none. So presumably this dog's eyes were the only bodied part that was affected in this case. Um, and, uh, what else am I forgetting to say? I can't think of anything else. Um, sometimes we will receive a single globe from a dog that has this, uh, severe granulomatous, um, and, uh, inflammatory condition of the scleritis, of the sclera. Um, and generally speaking, it's considered to be a bilateral disease. However, it's not uncommon for us to only receive a single eye and for them to not mention anything about the other eye which could indicate that the other eye truly is unaffected or hasn't become affected yet. Um, I don't know if this can uh, occur um, asynchronously and asymmetrically. So there we go. I did not do um, any bug stains, um, but I could have done a fungal stain, but I, I'm pretty sure like 99.9% .9 sure it would have been negative um, and this would just be considered idiopathic inflammation. Yeah. Do you think about if they're treatment strategy changes if you diagnose like a necrotizing scleritis versus like a systemic histiocytosis? Good question. Because like if both yeah. the eyes are out, then who cares if it's a scleritis, right. but if it's systemic histiocytosis, like do they That's a good point. treat the dog? <laughs> That's yeah, a good that's point. The reason we use those we call those reactive because we don't we don't get a lot of information about systemic diseases on those. So if you check the uh, the literature reactive psychosis breaks down as systemic and cutaneous, right? And this one, the periocular ones, they don't fit any. It, it's kind of like solitary, mm -hmm. you know, uh, organ specific reactive psychosis, if that's the case, right? So we don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. We don't know if those would be, they have uh, potential to become systemic psychosis or not, but you're right. It, it will be. I guess in both cases, uh, immune suppression and you know heavy anti-inflammatory treatment. I guess, and that takes us to our second case. That I'm well, my second right. case, I should say. Um, so this is um, the globe from. There's a theme here, FYI. Um, so this is the left globe from a 15 year old Shih Tzu. 
uh, spade female. Um, they say uh, four plus X ophthalmus with severe lag of thalamus and a large crust on the cornea. Um, large soft swelling at the dorsal orbital rim, uh, parentheses inflammatory versus neoplasia, that has increased in size. Uh, three plus iris atrophy with a few strands, but a mobile pupil. Hyperpigmented iris temporally with slightly raised appearance, but no scleral invasion, possibly benign, question mark. No flare, normal lens, uh, three plus asteroid hylosis, and normal fundus. Um, so they actually had previously biopsied this lesion, um, and we got that sample, and we diagnosed, um, let's see if I have that here, I probably don't. Um, we diagnosed um, histiocytic inflammation. Um, and suggested this that this could be reactive slash systemic histiocytosis. Um, so I get the feeling it continued to enlarge, and so they eventually decided to enucleate, well, exenerate, um, to try to get rid of it and get a more definitive diagnosis, because I think we got relatively small pieces of tissue before. So uh, here is our gross photo. Um, up here we have the eyelids. So uh, this was hemisected with everything attached. Uh, eyelids are here. Um, here's the cornea. Um, here's the nice lens. Here's that beautiful asteroid hyalosis that the submitter suggests or uh, recognized. And then here's that mass. Um, so it's sort of an interesting um, heterogeneous looking mass with some pinker areas and some more off-white areas. Um, and it really does bulge right up into the conjunctival substantia propria. And so there's quite a bit of expo exposure changes here. And also the cornea is the corneal epithelium and superficial stroma is pigmented like a good pug. Oh, sorry. It's a shih tzu. Just kidding. Um, kept thinking it was a pug. All right, so I'm going to switch over to the important program first. Okay, so so there's our sort of sad, squished little uh, uh, excuse me, eye. Um, right down here, the corneal epithelium is hyperplastic and there's a bunch going on in the superficial stroma, but that's not really the most exciting thing. Um, here is that mass. Um, once again, even at this low magnification, you can see how heterogeneous it is with these pockets of more basophilic areas uh, admixed with the pinker areas. There's quite a bit of sectioning artifact in this piece of tissue. So actually I'm gonna show you a smaller piece of tissue to show you the more um, the features of the cells of that mass. But before we do that, I'll just show you the corneal changes real quick. They are similar to, but not quite as severe as the last eye that we just looked at. Lost. Okay, there we go. Um, so we've got um, greatly hyperplastic corneal epithelium with some nice reti ridge formation. And as we get closer, it is uh, pigmented. You can see some of that brown pigment in these cells. And also it is uh, nicely keratinized. So we've definitely got epidermalization of this corneal stroma or epithelium as well. And then the superficial stroma is vascularized. It is fibrotic, a little bit disorganized, i.e. fibrotic and infiltrated by um, lymphocytes, plasma cells. And there are some melanin laden macrophages in here, which go along with the epithelial pigmentation. So now that we've gotten really to understand most of what's going on inside the eye, let's take a closer look at a better example of what's going on in that mass. Um, so this was a chunk that was cut off the mass specifically so that we could get a better quality um, histologic section because um, the person who grossed it knew that that would happen to the bigger piece that was still attached to the eye. So once again, we have these areas of more dense basophilia and that's where the lymphocytes are. And then when we go adjacent to those areas and look at those cells there, we have um, a lot of very bland, plump uh, spindle cells with kind of bland looking nuclei, but I guess pretty prominent looking nucleoli. And um, then we also have a bunch of eosinophils in here. So really the, everybody came out to party. And let's see if I can find a plasma cell in this one. They're probably around. This guy might be a plasma cell right there. But anyway, so there's mixed inflammation. I'd say the majority of the cells are actually these uh, very plump spindle cells, which once again, I'm assuming are macrophages or histiocytes, depending on your point of view. Um, and um, that is essentially what this lesion is composed of. Um, so we have very bland histiocytic inflammation. 
Unlike the last case, I was not terribly convinced of perivascular whorling, uh, which is supposedly the pathognomonic hallmark feature of reactive histiocytosis, according to Peter Moore's paper and Peter Moore himself. Um, but I think he himself may have admitted occasionally that it's not always that obvious. Um, and I think most pathologists would agree that uh, the things that we want to call reactive histi histiocytosis don't always have the, the pathognomonic perivascular whirling. Um, so that is um, the gist of this case. So I'll just cut back over to the PowerPoint. And so um, there we go. So histiocytic, lymphoplasmocytic, and eosinophilic orbital, quote unquote, cellulitis. I don't like using that word, but I'm not sure what else to call it. Um, this one was quite extensive and differential diagnosis or reactive parentheses, systemic histiocytosis. And in this case, it had dirty margins. So that actually brings up an important point to get back to Kelsey's question is when we call it something like reactive or systemic histiocytosis, what did the clinicians go back and do, particularly in this case where there's quote unquote dirty margins. Now this is an inflammatory condition and really shouldn't behave as a neoplasm, but apparently even the cutaneous form of this, which is the better studied form of it, can eventually become systemic. So it's kind of acts like a neoplasm to a certain extent. Um, we um, years ago started gathering follow-up information on a bunch of these exact type of cases where we have this gigantic, gigantic orbital mass um, that was removed because of concern for neoplasia. And then we diagnosed this relatively bland um, histiocytic lesion. Um, and we started gathering follow-up to see um, what, if any treatments were pursued after this diagnosis, whether it recurred and um, due to extreme busyness, never got back to it. But there's a great project in the making here um, because a lot of people have this exact question, especially like in this case, I'm sure the clinician was like, well, what do I do with this? It's got dirty margins. It's like this extensive mass-like lesion. Um, this is a 15 year old dog. So it's possible that by the time this would recur, if it would even would recur, um, the dog might be um, over the hill uh, or you know has passed on for other reasons um, over the rainbow. Under the hill, right? Under the hill. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, but anyway, so unfortunately, we just don't know what to tell people. Um, most of the time, it seems like this can be a very um, isolated lesion in the orbit, um, and it does not necessarily become systemic. Uh, we have one case where a dog actually did have um, lymph node involvement, but that was like, the vast minority of cases. I can't think of any others that we've gotten that diagnosis for or uh, information about. So anyway, there you go. So there's some comments here. <clears throat> Carol asked about, um, what about orbital NVE? Uh, I guess it is, um, the way we think about it, they're probably at the same spectrum. NGE, granulomatous pleuritis, react to this cytosis. I think they, it all goes back to, Diseases where histocytes get confused <laughs> and the cytobate rules are this cytostop obeying the rules. Um, so yeah, I think it's partially kind of the same thing. One thing that's interesting, a lot of the very ocular cases that we received that were mass-like seem to be targeting or around the third eyelid and third eyelid gland. Um another anecdotal or another another fact that uh, we don't necessarily understand the significance of, but just so you know. Cool. Any other questions or comments on these cases? Right. Oh, and um, Maria, sorry, I missed. Um, Maria asked about um, uh, inflammatory pseudotumor, which is another mm -hmm. bag of uh, mm -hmm. weird I mean yes it is it that's is. a great name for this yeah <laughs> we never use it we never use it yeah <laughs> all right this is our next case uh let me make sure we've got the right number here we there okay uh, so this is a 13-year-old spayed female domestic short-haired cat. 
Um, and as you can see, this gross photo is uh, through the whole globe. Uh, we're looking through the cornea um, at the iris. Um, and the history is that there were numerous attached uveal cysts, which they uh, performed laser treatment on. Uh, and then the cat developed glaucoma and went blind. Um, so that's the basic history. Uh, they do also note that there are cysts in the other eye as well. Um, so uh, this front image of the eye, uh, while it is whole, uh, reveals uh, potentially some degree of dyscoria. I will support that there probably was dyscoria uh, in vivo as well and not just fixation artifact, um, but basically the iris leaflet up here looks a little shorter and a little bit longer ventrally. Um, and then sort of underneath the ventral iris leaflet peeking out uh, at the edge of the pupillary margin, there are these sort of ruffly looking uh, brown bumps, which uh, are the uveal cysts, as it turns out. Again, I'll support that in a second histologically. Um, you may also note that the cat's iris in this case is blue, which has nothing to do with this, but <laughs> there you are. Uh, all right, uh, let's see. And F11, right? Yes, there we go. Okay. Try a subgross first. May or may not be useful. Um, so we have uh, the globe right here. We have a uh, gonio slice or basically an extra uh, slice of the globe um, in with the original cassette, which helps us to look at an additional level of the globe right away in our initial slides. Um, but uh, I'm trying to move this stage and not the slide itself. There we go. Uh, so you can kind of see from low uh, magnification here, this longer and thinner iris leaflet on this side. I'll try and get into better focus. That is better focus. Longer and thinner, yeah, it kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> iris leaflet on this side and this sort of messy brown stuff in the posterior chamber and comparing that to a thicker and maybe shorter iris leaflet on that side. Uh, let's take it away from the thumb growth because it is better focused away from that. And come over here. And so here's a closer image of the same. Long, thin iris leaflets and all of these um, cysts, it, uh, basically posterior iris and ciliary body cysts, which are formed by these uh, typically single cell layers of pigmented low cuboidal cells. Um, so we have a check on the uveal cysts and uh, showing off the, again, the difference in the iris leaflets. Um, so I'm going to skip over the elephant in the room briefly and just confirm for you another thing. This cat does have glaucoma, as they said clinically. Um, we can see that cupping even from way back here. Um, so here's a closer view, however, of that uh, cupped optic nerve. And then cats uh, tend to maintain their retinal architecture uh, a little bit better with uh, glaucoma. So you can still make out uh, the nice neat layers. Uh, however, when you look closely at this retina, even in the central retina, um, there are basically no gang retinal ganglion cells to be had. So uh, those are all gone. Um, and this is the typical presentation of a chronic glaucoma in a cat retina and optic nerve. So we've got the cysts, we've got a bit of dyscoria, and we've got a glaucoma. However, the rear corneal angles in this cat are nice and open, and you can make out really distinct and lovely pectinate ligaments. Um, you may think to yourself, well, maybe primary open angle glaucoma in the cat, which is a good differential in a case like this, where the rear corneal angle is well formed, but we have a clear chronic glaucoma. However, the one histologic sign of primary open angle glaucoma in cats, which is a sort of mixoid or clear looking material deposited around the uh, vessels of the scleral venous plexus, is not here. And so then the other differential that uh, could be on your list for uh, basically an open angle glaucoma or a glaucoma where there's no structural cause uh, or secondary cause could be aqueous misdirect. And indeed, if you look in the posterior chamber of this cat, even on this side without the cysts, which is probably a better place to look in this case, the uh, ciliary body plicae are sort of angled anteriorly. Um, you can maybe uh, sort of uh, subjectively determine that the corneal angle is a little bit narrowed. Um, and then we have this, uh, let's go a little closer in. We have this sort of vague pale eosinophilic line here, um, which is likely a line that is delineating the anterior vitreal face. And that anterior vitreal face is prolapsed anteriorly into the posterior chamber. It should be back behind the lens. It's a little bit too far forward in this case. Um, 
So these uh, signs, the anterior angling of the ciliary body plique, the narrowing of the corneal angle, and the anterior prolapse of the vitri anterior vitreal face, um, are basically the only histologic findings we have to make a diagnosis of aqueous misdirect. Um, aqueous misdirect uh, overall, though, is a diagnosis of exclusion. Basically, you need to make sure that there aren't other causes of glaucoma in this cat before you can make that diagnosis or suggest that as a differential. Um, in this case, we did suggest that as a differential. So kind of an unusual cause of glaucoma in a cat, and then the added uh, oddity of these uh, uveal cysts um, and the dyscoria. And you can see on this side with this more elongate uh, iris leaflet where the cysts are sort of the worst or most plentiful, um, in this, on this side, the uh, iridocorneal angle is particularly narrowed. Um, so I would kind of wonder in this case what role the iridociliary cysts had um, or whether they had a role in the onset of glaucoma. Um, just sort of an interesting thing. Usually these sorts of things are incidental um, and don't cause any issues in eyes. So um, an unusual case, usual case of glaucoma in a cat. Um, kind of cool. We have a question here. Go for it. Um, we're asking about in the beginning of the um, discuss what caused the um, the uh, darkening of, of the iris stroma that we see grossly on a microscopic level. Mm -hmm. What would have caused that? I think it's probably what Megan was showing that the markedly thinned iris leaflet on this side and the presence of those heavily pigmented cysts behind. Because um, here they're they're definitely behind the iris, but um, do they project through the pupillary space at all? They, they do. They, they, they sort of peak like they, around yeah. the end. Uh, it's more obvious in the gross photo, right, I think, exactly. the way they yeah. sort of peak around the and end. projecting through the pupillary space. Mm -hmm. So I guess the combination of the thinning and stretching of the iris and the presence of the pigmented cysts behind that likely caused a darkened appearance of the iris. That's a reasonable supposition. <laughs> Was that? Was that really yeah, and, yeah, especially, and, and Jamie's pointing out, it is a blue eyed cat, so it would be easier for the light to get through that. And the change in color would be more easy to perceive. Mm -hmm. ah. All right, uh, the key diagnoses for this case here. Uh, any other questions or comments before we move on to the next case? Okay. Here's the next case, also a cat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This thing up here is always in the way. I should really learn to move the labels off the side so we can see them more easily. Let me just make sure I have the right paperwork here. Can I? Oh, I'm too scared to mess anything up. All right. Uh, so <laughs> Too technologically inept. Uh, all right, so this is a seven-year-old neutered male domestic short-haired cat. Um, the clinical history that is described is a severe bouthalmia, lag up thalamus, axial corneal ulcer, severe corneal vascularization, cannot evaluate intraocular structures due to the corneal disease. So that's what we've got. Um, basically just a bouthalmic eye, presumably corneal disease related to exposure from the inability to close the eyelids fully over the surface of that eye. Um, here is the hemisected view of that eye, and it's very, very interesting on the inside. Um, I believe the gross examiner in this case uh, felt like it almost looks like a double lens, and I would agree with that. <laughs> kind of looks like a double lens almost, but um, the actual lens is here in the middle. Um, and then we also, though, have this ball of sort of translucent, uh, whitish, tannish tissue in the back of the eye behind the lens. And then on top of that, the entire globe is filled with this sort of goopy, uh, sort of mucoid or viscous uh, fluid. Um, you can kind of see like bubbles suspended in it um, or bits of debris suspended in it. Um, but that was kind of the character of it on gross exam. Um, so very interesting. Uh, you can kind of make out, uh, I think you can make out here on the gross as well, that often there's this sort of white tan tissue carpeting the intraocular structures in this case as well. Um, so interesting gross, and we will go to the histology. How old would you say? Seven year old. Okay. 
that I'm going to bother with the subgroups in this case. Uh, so um, we have uh, lots of material, sort of purple, um, carpeting various surfaces. I'll take you on a quick tour uh, at low magnification around this globe just to see the extent of this material that is carpeting the uvial surfaces and invading, um, for example, into the choroid. And then this ball of tissue that looked like our second sort of translucent structure in the back of the globe here, um, which is these sort of anastomosing trabeculae of something with a background of something more loose and pale staining, and we'll come back to that again. Um, the optic nerve also is rather too purple, uh, and that purple extends to the edges. And we'll just complete our tour going all the way around, hopefully not making anyone ill. Um, the lens was sort of incompletely sampled in this case, but we do have part of the lens capsule here in the posterior chamber with this lovely curling of the posterior lens capsule suggestive of the lens capsule rupture. And finishing off our tour, again, showing more of these cells carpeting uveal surfaces here. So uh, I'm not going to go over the corneal disease too much. There's an ulcer there. It's probably associated with the exposure. We're going to focus on the stuff that is carpeting surfaces inside the eye. And when we look closer at these guys, they turn out to be neoplastic cells. Um, so up here, they look kind of round um, and distinctly demarcated. Um, and let me take you up here really quick without being too high. Let's see if I can find my favorite cell of this case, <laughs> which I should have made sure here we are. There we go, my favorite cell of this case. If you were unsure that this was neoplasm or neoplasia, uh, you can take a look at the cell, which is huge and a giant nucleus and a really giant distinct nucleolus. Uh, so um, we have a, a sort of round cell population, but then often in areas like this, they sort of uh, become more spindle or almost stellate shaped. So there's some significant variability in the cell uh, shape and size. Another feature that's kind of interesting in these cells is the way these nuclei are often eccentric, uh, easier to see on this giant cell <laughs> um, compared to some of the other ones. And um, maybe something of a perinuclear clearing, um, like these cells might be making something. And then uh, probably better seen, sorry to zoom around on this side. And also in that thing at the back of the eye, which we'll visit in a second. So maybe we'll actually just go straight there because I'm not pleased with that field yet. Here we go. Better exemplified perhaps back here. We have um, we have uh, this sort of pale staining um, or pale basophilic uh, material uh, that is surrounding these cells in a lot of sections. Um, so they're making a sort of mixoid or mucinous material uh, or surrounded by it. Um, and we have a similar situation back here with the same sort of material that these cells are surrounded by. And then here, uh, although the cells are probably a little bit necrotic and starting to lose some of their detail, um, they're showing off a lot more of that sort of spindle to stellate morphology rather than the rounder morphology that's up front. Um, so definitely a really weird neoplastic population. Um, we threw an ultra blue on this slide. Uh, just to confirm for ourselves, this is just ultra blue. It's not ultra blue PAS. Uh, so a positive result is this lovely sort of tealish light blue. Um, and indeed, that material that is surrounding the neoplastic cells is picking up that stain. Um, and in this slightly deeper section that they did to make the Alchem blue, um, we can actually see a little bit more of a central section of the optic nerve head. And this tissue here is actually retina. And then as you follow the retina, the retina kind of blends into these neoplastic cells here. So they were invading the retina, at least. Um, so just a really interesting and kind of weird neoplasm in this cat eye. And we had a few differentials for this. Call it poorly differentiated intraocular neoplasm to start with, because I think without extensive IHC, maybe even electron microscopy, it would be difficult to be absolutely certain of a cell line origin. Um, but some of our differentials up there based on the location that it developed in and the uh, morphologic features that we do have available are listed. 
Um, for me, kind of an order of what I would expect to be more likely versus less likely, um, myxosarcoma, a myxoid variant of a malignant nerve sheath tumor, um, maybe a very poorly differentiated chondrosarcoma. There is a case series out there that Koplau published of um, chondrosarcoma in cat eyes that have similar histologic features to this one. Um, so check that out. Uh, and then um, uh, there are other differentials out there that could potentially be on this list. Um, there's also a myxoid variant of liposarcoma, for example, but you know, kind of hard to put that high on our list in this case. Um, and then the other differential uh, for a case like this, um, so that carpeting behavior that we saw inside the eye um, is a feature that is common with metastatic disease to the eye. Um, and uh, however, there are like some mass effects going on, especially in the retina in the back. Um, so uh, differentials of either a tumor that developed inside the eye and just has carpeting behavior versus a tumor that metastasized to the eye from elsewhere. Um, and it would be difficult for us to confirm that histologically. Um, another feature, which I'm gonna quickly show you before we move on from this case, that was interesting, although hard to necessarily draw conclusions from, in terms of the debate over metastasis versus um, a primary tumor, uh, the iris leaflet on this side of the globe is totally infarcted. Um, it's necrotic uh, with a coagulative necrosis, so you can still make out the tissue architecture. It's just that the cell detail is totally gone. Um, so just sort of skating along this infarcted iris um, and sort of, sort of a segmental uh, delineated coagulative necrosis. And it kind of makes me wonder if there's something going on in the vessels nearby. Um, that said, I scoured these slides and didn't find any intravascular neoplastic cells. Um, so a weird tumor and lots of differentials and not a lot of specific answers, um, but also a very interesting case to look at together. Um, we so far have not gotten any further follow-up uh, or further requests to do additional testing on this case. So we may end up stuck at this uh, state of wondering, but uh, definitely an unusual tumor. Um, and uh, yeah, there we are. Um, that's, that's a question. I mean, that you could maybe do like do? Yeah. <laughs> IFCs plus EM plus like a bunch of other stuff, and then maybe we could get closer to an answer, but yeah. I, it... Best case scenario, I guess, for a diagnosis for on our end would be if they get back to us with Results of the systemic workup in this case, and yeah, yeah they, they find a primary, nothing, yeah, no systemic or apparent systemic neoplasm. Then we can think about okay, it's probably primary, then we'll still be at the same spot, but at least we'll know it's not the same. Um, yeah, definitely an interesting case. Uh, all right, I move. Yeah, Maria said we should go by the next. <laughs> I mean, you could do a song or 10 for the PMST. <laughs> right. But, like, I don't know what you use. But maybe an S for 100 and NST. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all <Most>. positive. <laughs> 300 bucks. Right. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, next up, we've got. Uh, an eye from an 11 year old uh, Siberian Husky. This is the right eye. Um, we have a history of a ciliary body mass in the medial qu quadrant of the right eye. It's been there since December of 2022. Um, this is a representative gross photo um, from our um, our batch of photos that we have um, so we can see that there was indeed a ciliary body mass here, kind of sitting right in here between um, the iris leaf lids and it hugs the lens. And there's uh, not a whole lot else going on, um, grossly. So, And then we can see the same thing um, on our subgross view um, of the globe. Here uh, we've got the mass is a little bit artificial, artificially separated. Here you can kind of see where it would have been sitting right here, um, kind of lining the ciliary body and the iris, um, and again hugs the lens.
Um, so we have this cute little mass. Again, you can see the compression on the ciliary body and sort of on the uh, back of the iris here where it would be lining and kind of coming from, from the epithelium that lines these guys. And so we have this mass, it's forming uh, little cords and lobules, uh, sometimes asinine and tubules of these neoplastic epithelial cells. Um, they have indistinct cell borders, monomets of eosinophilic cytoplasm, the nuclei around oval, um, not much pleomorphism um, in the uh, tumor cells here, kind of bland. Um, we do have areas where there's um, a little bit of increased eosinophilic material in between, um, some of it's being basement membrane being produced, um, which would highlight very nicely with the PAS, um, if we so choose to do so. Um, and not a lot of mitotic activity. And again, kind of hugs the lens here, it's attached. Um, and there's a little bit of asteroid hyalosis kind of at the back here. This is a common uh, feature uh, with this tumor. Uh, we see it often enough that sometimes we get sad when we don't see it with this tumor because it's so commonly there. Um, it's not specific for this tumor, but um, it's a very nice addition to it. Uh, and there wasn't much else going on um, in the rest of the eye, maybe a little pre irritable fibrovascular membrane on the front of the iris. Um, but the back of the eye was fairly quiet, um, so no evidence of uh, glaucoma. Um, so this was uh, iridociliary adenoma, uh, had nice clean margins as they often do. Um, they are benign uh, epithelial tumors of the uh, iris and or ciliary body epithelium. Uh, they rarely recur and they rarely re metastasize um, and enucleation uh, with these clean margins is, is pretty um, curative in these cases. Um, it's just a nice uh, clean example of a common uh, tumor for the iridociliary guys. And in contrast, this other eye, uh, this one is the left eye from a 12 year old male neutered Shih Tzu uh, that was diagnosed um, with retinal detachment and hyphema in March of this year. And then in May uh, had a possible intraocular neoplasm diagnosed. Um, so the eye uh, was open and comfortable, uh, had some episcleral injunct injection, um, and they noticed a peak raised round perilimbal mass uh, that has um, associated intraocular white vascular lesion, suspecting a neoplasm or possibly versus episcleritis. Um, we had some corneal pigment um, and edema and fibrosis. Um, they did say that the uh, hyphema had resolved somewhat uh, in the anterior chamber um, and that they couldn't um, visualize the lens and the fundus um, based on what was going on in the front of the eye. Um, when they went in to take out the eye, um, they noted a regular lobulated um, firm protrusion, protrusion from the ventral equator uh, posterior to the mass. Um, so here is our uh, hemisection of the globe with the lids uh, still attached here. And so here's cornea, you can see a bit of the pigment, and then you can see this mass lesion and how it kind of comes out here and kind of um, effaces the sclera uh, on this end. Uh, we do have a little bit of lens um, sticking here, some evidence of that chronic hemorrhage. We've got some nice red and some nice uh, yellow um, for the blood breakdown products. Um, and it's kind of difficult to see what was maybe going on with the retina, uh, but we'll take a closer look at that histologically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Ye
we did ask if maybe there's maybe a, a systemic hypertension playing a role. Um, I don't think we saw any uh, blood vessel changes uh, to support that, but we don't always get to see that histologically. It was an older um, Shih Tzu patient. Um, and a lot of these cases uh, that Coplar has, um, has a history of having a gentamicin injection. Um, sometimes um, I think they can even be injected if they don't realize that there's a neoplasm inside and the gentamicin um, injection kind of angrifies the tumor and um, kind of makes it go uh, more malignant. Um, and in about 30% of the cases, um, there uh, is disseminated metastasis, uh, which would has been found in the lung, the liver, kidney, and abdominal cavity. Um, so it's just kind of a, again, kind of a range of our irrosolary tumors that we can see uh, in this case. So we got five minutes. I'll try to present yeah. that case that we'd be cool. bringing over. All right. Extra bonus for you guys. Okay, is that? Yeah, if I have time, I'll present it. It's like they have touched it. Yeah, so this is a cool one. It's a, let's see, nine year old female spade husky mixed dog with a history of severe panuviatis on the right eye, secondary glaucoma. The uviatis was uh, not responsive to any treatment. Uh, there was a low coccidioides titer detected, so they were suspecting a potentially infectious process. They also describe, let's see, however, comma, there's a pink fluffy iris nodule in the ventral temporal area, and they were concerned about that. So they want to know if that's a granulomatous reaction or something else. Turns out to be something else, but not just one something else, a few something else's. So... Here's the eye. You can see it is a husky, a blue-eyed dog. You can see how the back of the eye is poorly pigmented. And here is the white fluffy mass in the iris they described. You can see the other iris leaflet here, the iris pigmented epithelium, and kind of a white discoloration of the iris. We'll focus on that, but also you know, look around a little bit here, keep that in mind. Don't worry about that too much for now. And let's move on to the slide and I'll be quick so we don't go beyond our time. So the leg, you get in there. Ignore the artifact. You can see that there's some uh, thickening of the iris and a hypercellularity to it. Everything else is relatively quiet. And there's something there, but I'm not going to tell you guys what it is right now. It's too late. And uh, got to keep the suspense a little bit. Uh oh. <laughs> so, not an uncommon situation where clean this up pretty quick. This was described as an inflammatory reaction, but once we get a little closer, you realize that this iris leaflet is too hypercellular and it's not an inflammatory hypercellularity. These are neoplastic cells and they're fusiform and they're going here, there, and everywhere. They're forming uh, pretty distinct worlds. Uh, and some streams, and there is a neuropil looking background throughout this mass. These the neoplastic cells are also in the surface of the iris, forming a pseudo peridot fibrovascular membrane. It's almost uh, not almost, it is a neoplastic membrane and extends a little bit over the pupillary space, forming it looks like a whip. You can see that on the other side too, right? Uh, I should have started here because it's even more pronounced on this iris leaflet. So this is a uh, schwannoma, and this is a blue-eyed dog. So this is a schwannoma of the blue-eyed dogs. Let me put those two things together. 
And you can see how the neoplastic cells also infiltrate and efface the irritocornal angle and the aqueous drainage structures. That's why these dogs develop glaucoma. And you can also understand why it wouldn't be necessarily identified as a mass right away, because the way these tumors, the, these tumors develop, they grow uh, 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 kind of insidiously and they distort the tissue faster than they actually form a mass. So it's not uncommon for cases like that to have been described as chronic uveitis because of the color changes in the iris that do not respond to you know, a, a treatment and develop glaucoma. And another hidden factoid here is this dog is from Scottsdale, Arizona. The reason that matters is because when you go in the episclera, there are thingies. We're not supposed to be there. There are multiple coalescing granulomas. A lot of them are mineralized. When you look inside some of these, we can find some fossilized creatures. So these are fossils of Oncocerca um, with a granulomatous reaction. You can see some, um, you know, there's the, the cuticle and there is right here, you can see some degenerated organs, maybe some babies. Um, the reason we know it's Oncocerca, well, it's a, it, it, at this point is an educated gas because uh, these are dead nematodes with a granulomatous reaction around. And we know um, the most common ones we find are Oncocerca. The female Oncocerca has some pretty, some pretty adornments to their walls, to their uh, cuticles, which, you know, you gotta use your imagined scope here, but if you look around, you might see some regions forming on the surface, uh, on cross section, they look like bridges, but they're more, more like uh, kind of a spiral uh, 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 ridge around the, the, the outer layer of, of, the, of the nematode. I think it helps them move around. And that's uh, one of the classic morphologic features for the female Oncocerca. And here's some uh, mineralized, fossilized, um, sort of just the highlights of the, of the organisms. So that's the twofer that we had here, two for one a spindle cell tumor of the blue-eyed dogs and uh, episcleral onchocerciasis. And the reason I mentioned the geographic location of these dogs is that these are hyper-local. We see uh, onchocerca, so this is an uh, aberrant migration of onchocerca. We see them in areas where um, very dry climate surrounding, usually a basin of water of some sort. So Salt Lake City, uh, Southern California, Arizona and uh, Greece, uh, Thessaloniki in Greece, which is the original place where we started getting those cases from. And just a uh, microscopic finding. Sometimes they get biopsy as being mass-like, especially when they're more towards the front of the eye. But in this case, uh, they didn't even know it was there. So thanks everyone. Um, see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh,